Welcome to my Pentathlon book launch. You'll note that for most of the book launch, I'll be doing screen share so that the words of the poems are clearly visible to my dear friends who are hearing impaired. I'm doing this specifically for them, although it may also be useful to you if you like to read along when things are being um, read out loud. So I was a total novice to the publishing world when I had my first book published, I didn't even know what a book launch was. So I got the book together. It was released in 2016. And the only thing I knew about marketing at the, that point was the zucchini approach. And if you've ever raised zucchini or live near someone who raises zucchini, you'll understand. First, you use as much as you can for yourself. Then you unload as much as you can on your friends and neighbors. Then you go to your coworkers. Then you grab people off the street, try to unload some zucchini on them. It's not a very successful method. And I, although I did sell some books to friends, neighbors, family, coworkers, um, the world in general knew nothing about my book. But that didn't stop me from getting a second book published a few years later. I, by that time, I knew a little more about publishing, but I still didn't understand book launches. I did, however, find out that Kelsey Books um, is a reliable publisher, and I had friends online who were publishing books with them. I went to their website, found out that they were open for manuscripts, so I submitted, was accepted in 2019, and for their schedule, I was I was scheduled for 2020 publication, which happened, but it also happened to land in the middle of the pandemic. So there was no public meetings, no poetry readings in person, and no certainly no book launches. Um, and that did even more poorly than my first book did. That's okay. I'm not a real quick learner, so when a publisher approached me and asked if I would be interested in publishing with them. I said yes, because I was kind of hooked on having that hard copy book in my hands and uh, feeling like I was just doing all the right things. So I got the manuscript together, and book number three, titled Leave a Light On, was published in 2021. Unfortunately, we were still in the pandemic. Quarantine was still in place. So again, no launch limited exposure, very little success with book sales. The same publisher approached me twice more, once in 22 and once in 23, to see if I would like to publish more books with them. And I did, um, As If a Caress was published in 22, and then my most recent Goodbye Sounds Like was published in 23. So that was my experience with publishing but zero experience with doing book launches. And when I finally figured out how and what to do, I thought, why not just introduce all five of these at the same time? So what I'm going to do is present each book individually, then read one or two poems, probably two, maybe three, from the book. But to keep you from falling asleep from the monotony of my own voice, I have invited the editor slash publisher of my first book to read some of the poems with me. As it turns out, not only was he the publisher of my first book, but he's also my oldest son. So what I'm going to do is give you a good look at the photograph that formed the background for the cover of my book. This was for a clear day in October. It's taken in the Uinta Mountains in Utah. So I am going to give you a quick rundown on the book itself. I'd been writing poetry for over 20 years, seriously. Never considered publishing a book. I'd also been doing a lot of photography for 10, 15 years, and occasionally paired a photograph with a poem. And I thought, that's a cool thing to do. And then it finally occurred to me that I could publish a book of poetry, maybe, with both the poetry and the photography. So when I was sounding out my son Brian about how to do that, 
since he had become a part-time editor and publisher, he agreed to publish the book for me as long as it was up to standard. So we worked on that. In the end, I did in I did have a full-length collection of poetry and color photography. And to date, I will say without hesitation, I am most pleased with this book. Uh, of all five that I've published, this is the one that still just makes me smile the most. So with that in mind, um, I'm going to ask Brian to read a couple of poems. The first one was prompted by a discussion with a friend who was starting a new job, new career at age 60. And she was fretting about how much easier it would be not to be doing this again at that point in life. And she made the statement of wanting to reincarnate. So I took that and ran with it. And I am going to share that poem with you as Brian reads. Can we just reincarnate? Wouldn't it be great, she asked, if we could just reincarnate? Drop these tired, broken bodies and step into new flesh, new bones, new sneakers and new jeans. She laughed at the thought, pulled a photo from a red clutch as tired and worn as she was. Look, me at 16, full of ambition and no direction. 60 was nowhere in my mind, my heart, my bones, like it is today. Do you think age has weight, she wondered aloud, and answered herself, I do, yes, I do. Everything feels heavier, harder to hold up, harder to hold on to. She thinks about her uncle and his, his heaviness of heart, of mind, of body, tries to fathom his loneliness, that universal, unique pain of separation, of sorrow, the turning to one no longer there to complain or whisper his love. Just today, someone said, at least she this or that. At least he something else. And it was meaningless, wasted words, and no comfort at all. She looks up suddenly and smiles, remembering she is not alone, though she has been more often than not, more often when it mattered most. Do you know how hard it is starting over again at 60 with new work, new wrinkles, new worries? He smiled at the rhetorical question as he scribbled a new poem on her neck, and yes, he said quietly, yes. The second poem from A Clear Day in October was the result of a discussion with a friend about the effect of music that's written in 6-8 time, and was specifically prompted by Carol King's recording of Natural Woman. 6-8 time. Slow and bluesy, I listen to the piano, lay the foundation for the hungry voice that whispers and wails how she feels like a natural woman, and somehow it's my fault. I ignore her boastful lament, concentrate on the chords, tonic, dominant, seventh, walk the bass down, modulate. I think I have it, and the keys under my fingers reluctantly agree. Singers are never in short supply, and one who has loitered outside the door of my practice room is happy to provide the voice, in fact, already knows the words, the emphasis and pauses that make this piece thrill me. I shiver as she ends soft and low. The conversation after leads somehow to a dance. She claims the meter of a song can pick you up and slammed up can just pick you up and slam dunk drop you in love with whomever you're at, with whomever you're with at the time, wants to demonstrate, so the needle meets the vinyl, sets the bluesy piano off again. She slips her arms around me, begins to move in six, eight time, and there I am in love forever, or at least until the song ends, and I don't even know her name. Thank you. My second book called Do You Hear It was published by Kelsey, as I mentioned before, in 2020. I'd uh, heard of them, submitted the manuscript in 2019, got it published in 2020, 
it kind of went nowhere because of COVID. But I arranged the book in sections specifically so I could group poems into something sort of meaningful. And as a result, I ended up with sections like music of one kind or another, or somber thoughts, death, darkness, or poems about poets and words and poetry and several others. Anyway, the two poems that I'm going to share now are both about family. One of them is imaginary. One of them is autobiographical. If I can get the cursor right. The first poem is called Fusion, and it goes like this. I finally understand the term nuclear family as memories on top of regrets, years of neglected feelings, press harder and harder on the center of my soul until dreams dripping radiation explode in my nights, flashes of when life was, if not good, at least better, when innocence was eight years old and unaware of the bomb about to be dropped. Fusion, fission, fragments of failure run through me, through him, like white atomic heat tearing us, melting us, nothing but ashes left where emotions ran dry. Does it matter at all that 40 years later, I know him in name only? Recognize nothing about him. Only feel the small pull of electrons in orbit, looking for completeness, for familiar, for family. I photograph his aging hand, as if somehow the palmer lines, the callus at each fingertip might register on the Geiger of my heart. I can't take a picture of his face. I don't know why. I simply don't know why. Second poem is a father and son poem. Prodigal. Father and son argument over my place and his power pushed me out of home, full of arrogance and hate. Greyhound was close and I was gone. California called me. Friends with open arms and attitudes would replace the family from hell who no longer needed this conformist turned pacifist, hippie in my father's eyes. The anger that fueled my flight carried me to Flagstaff and beyond to Southern California where I knew it never rains. In the uneasy stillness of late night, butt on the floor, chin on my knees, Collins in my ears, the last of my fury faded, leaving me alone and lonely for all that I had so eagerly left. The realization punctuated by salty drips that found my cheeks but could not hold and fell like my pride down and away. The phone call was simple. Returning was not. No fatted calf, just resignation. Father and son hoping, neither quite believing, that things were somehow different. So let's pop out of that. And I'll give you the cover photo for my third book. The book title, Leave a Light On, <clears throat> was taken from a number of experiences, but one of them that um, sparked this was a conversation with someone about coming home and finding all the lights off. The introduction reads like this. No one who has been away from home and then returns wants to find the lights out and the door locked. We want to know that we have not been forgotten in our absence, that someone is waiting for us, anxious for us to come back. The photograph was uh, taken from a B&B &B where I stayed in Hollister, California, and then I manipulated it in Photoshop to look more like a painting. And I figured as long as my publishers were allowing me to choose my covers, I would keep using my photos. So I did. And two poems from this 
will be read by Brian. The first one was prompted by an online post by a friend. Um, it was accompanied by a photograph of the area around my hometown. So here we are. Brian will read these next two poems. Did you want to share the screen? There you go. If I had stayed, you posted another photo today of snow and red rock hills. It might have been from the south of town, couldn't really say, but I imagined the pass through the icy white powder as being yours, maybe those of another friend whose face has grown old like mine, old and hard and wintry. You seem so content to live in a place I couldn't wait to leave. Happy to be there, pleased with your choice to linger. It was home, it was mine, but it was never enough. I replay faulty memories from half a century ago, all of them tinged with various shades of loss, of love that sputtered and died in the high desert winds. I contemplate this latest scene and wonder, as I sometimes do, who would I be today if I had stayed? The second poem is the result of a conversation about death personified, and there have been plenty of poems and prose written about it, but this is my take. Death as a Naked Woman Came to me in an hour of despair, said she would be my escort home, fee paid in full, no tip required. She pulled my hand to a breast, the color of aged ivory, cold, silky, and smooth, not the pale, languid white of vampires' faces or the bloodless, dainty bosoms of medieval portraits. I was unmoved. She lifted my gaze to her eyes, not deep, dark pools of poet lore, but lively, sparkling emeralds, as though she had just flown in from Colombia, Zambia, or Brazil fresh from taking her fill of broken-backed miners. I did not blink. She brushed her lips across mine, smiled to show the seductive contrast of pearls against rubies, smoked softly, spoke softly, sweetly in my terrified ears, come into death, let me be your first and last desire. I forgot to breathe briefly, but I am old and thoughtful, no longer the fire-veined youth who would have leapt at the chance. No, I simply whispered back, you've got the wrong number. I'm waiting for the ancient one, black cloak, sharpened scythe, no face to speak of. That's the only death I care to follow. She took me anyway. That's always fun. So book number four, As If a Caress, came from a manuscript I'd put together but wasn't in a hurry to send out. And then Taj Mahal contacted me and wanted to print another book. So I said, why not? The title came from a comment made by a poet slash friend, Jeannie Roberts, um, who said something about October as a caress. Since October is my birth month, I liked it. I ran with it. It became the title of the book. And then there's also a poem called As If a Caress. So I am going to see if I can somehow bring up a photo that the cover was based on. Here we are. Something soft, touchable. Anyway, there are several aspects of caresses. Um, they can be physical, mental, emotional, but there aren't a lot of people who don't appreciate a caress, some touch that says, I recognize you, I acknowledge you. And 
here are three poems that are from that book. The first two I will read, and then I will hand off to Brian for the third one. Stick Men is based on those ubiquitous decals on the backs of car windows that have stick families sometimes with pets and then a lot of humor added over the time that they've been there. But stick people didn't seem like they would have any way to caress anything. So here, here's the poem. Stick men don't have shoulders, don't have hearts or sleeves to wear them on either. Don't have to worry about dress codes or workouts for six pack abs. Don't have hair to style or emotions to hide from scrutiny. Don't have shoes to lace or tie or teeth or smiles or frowns. Don't have anything to prove or anyone to prove things to. Don't have arguments with friends or jealousy or discontent. Do have wives and children. I've seen them on car windows. Do have stick pets too who never need cleaning up after. Don't have complicated lives to lead or work or debt or age or death. Don't have much, yet represent the simple complexity of everything we are. And then the title poem. October's evening light, as if a caress, soft brushing against my pain whispers as mother did then, that the coming darkness is not to be feared. October's evening light, as if a caress, lifts a quiet corner of night's quilt, draws it to rest on weary shoulders, shushes as mother did then, lullaby sung to its unchanging close. October's evening light, as if a caress, now only imagined but eternally real, dims day's demands and disappointments, invites, as mother did then, my wrinkled, worried frown, to sleep. This next poem is very much um, personal, both to me and to my father about whom it was written. My father was born at the beginning of the Great Depression. And as such, like many of that generation, he did a whole lot of doing without. He told me once about a time as a youngster when he had to wear girl's shoes from an older sister because that's all there was. It was that or bare feet and he couldn't go barefoot um, in the winter time. So this poem is going to be read by Brian and it's about those girl's shoes. Penny Loafers, born in 29, nearly last in a line of children that stretched across the Great Depression like a transcontinental railroad. By the time he started school, he was just a little slip of a hungry boy, amazed at how poverty pained and mocked him. Shoes were never new, but still required. And when a sister's hand-me-downs were the only things that fit his feet, then hand-me-downs it had to be. He gives a rueful smile, remembering how tough he had to pretend to be, while all the better-off boys in their sturdy leather cowboy boots made him their daily target, the butt of every joke. He says it didn't matter, but his face tells the story otherwise. How else can a small boy rationalize wearing penny loafers without a single penny? Thank you. So that brings us up to book number five. And the photo that I used for the cover of the book, interestingly enough, could be interpreted so many ways. It was taken of a couple out on the shores of the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Their body posture could be anything. It didn't look like they were excited at all about each other. And I originally titled the photograph, If You Leave Me Now. If you're as old as I am or have some familiarity with oldies music, 
the group Chicago should come to mind with their song. And you can hum that mentally while we're moving forward. At any rate, um, I'd been working on a manuscript and was really struggling with it. I had well over 80 poems in it and was trying to figure out how to group, how to assemble the, the manuscript so it made sense. I had an online friend, Michael Gessner, who is a contributing editor at Verse Virtual, who I asked if he would just take a look at it. I sent it to him. Oh, my gosh. He did more than take a look at it. He sent me back a four-page response talking about the poems that may not fit, poems that could be grouped together for a different manuscript, a different book, um, things that he felt worked well, things that he felt probably didn't belong in the book. And so based on his responses, I had started paring down the book and then suddenly got another invitation from Taj Mahal to publish a book with them, but they wanted a limit of 60 poems this time. So I said, we can do that. And then I finished paring the manuscript down, got the photo sent to them, got the book printed, and now I have five books of poetry. A couple of poems, maybe three from this book, starting with one type of sound of goodbye. Aging children. Why do songs last longest? Longer even than the memory of smells that call us home. My mother sang her mother's songs as I sing hers to you. Too small to join the chorus, but that will come. That will come when time and growing spin you, make star trails in your sky. Lullabies will fade to whatever is popular at the moment, but in the isolated nights, always the little tunes, always the tunes that cement you in place along the branching scrawl. You will sing them to yourself or to a budding leaf that you yourself have molded. You age, it's true, but rhymes and melodies do not. Melodies do not leave us alone or lonely. Like sap that ebbs in autumn, rises again in spring, the voiced love that taught a hundred mothers past will teach a thousand yet to come, as children come and come of age, humming softly and softly fade away. This next poem is a much more somber poem. Um, as people age, like I've been doing so nicely, um, it's common to contemplate death, whether it's your own or somebody else's. In this case, this poem was written in contemplation of my father's death. He's 94 and becoming more feeble and fading. And so it's a matter of time. And this is my contemplation on what will happen when he does die. A shovel full of dirt. The carpet of Northern New Mexico rolls out muted red, sandstone white, sagebrush green under blue endless skies where clouds whiter than winter snow flirt and billow. The freeway from Albuquerque to Gallup feels like it's been here forever though I have young memories of Route 66, fewer lanes and longer trips. No matter, this is what flows in my blood, fills my mind as I anticipate the inevitable news. I have no idea when it, come, when it will come, only know that when it does, I will pack up and fly, make the three hour drive from airport to carport, observe the rituals of his passing, Drive southeast to Rama, his heart and home. Greet cousins I haven't seen forever. And finally, after the obligatory prayers, without waiting to be asked, I will scoop my shovel into red-tinged sand. Listen to the clattering of dirt and rocks on coffin. Doing what old men have done forever. Whispering goodbye, cursing myself for the son I should have been burying my father along with a part of myself.
Let's end on something upbeat. This poem has been popular everywhere that it's been published and shared, and it is a really good goodbye poem. Before I go, every line must end correctly here. Every verb be in a perfect tense. It's been so long since I last read your voice, and if I had my way, my simple choice would be to trim the distance too immense between us make you miles and miles more near. And then come winter wind or autumn wind or winter snow, I'd see you wave and smile before I go. And here, I'm gonna leave this up for a minute or two or three, is my website where you can get purchase information on all five books, plus several chat books. And I'll leave that up for a second or two, for a minute or so. Brian, do you have anything else that you would like to add or comment on the books, particularly A Clear Day? Since this is going on YouTube, I think it's obligatory to say, please click like and subscribe. Awesome. Uh, I had absolutely enjoyed um, this entire process, and it was a delight to work with you on putting together the, uh, the first one, uh, Clear Day in October. Um, yeah, like I said, when we first talked about it, I have high standards and I only agree to do it if we could come up to that. And I'm absolutely as delighted as you are uh, at how it came out and for it to have launched this um, subsequent four books for a, a great five book launch is just uh, exciting. Thanks for letting me be a part of it. And thank you for joining me. So there's my collection of five books. Um, I'm still sharing the website in case you need to write it down. I will also put it in the comments uh, on my YouTube post of this same video. And I think that's probably enough for one night. We can come back to main screen, I think. I thought I could. I can. I'm back to my main screen. So thank you, thank you for listening through this. I hope you enjoyed the poems you heard and are excited to read more. And with that, I bid you all good night. <laughs>